do want to kind of just touch on on you know what sort of things would we need when we're actually walking into a client site or whether it's infrastructure that we own today and we're going to do that data migration what sort of information would we need to do that need so just as a very basic piece so we need the total number of you know let's just start small start inventory number of you know what's our inventory what are we moving from where are we going to What's the number of terabytes that we need? IO profile. Is it physical? Is it virtual? What? So I see you do storage assessments. What do you use to do this assessment? Do you have some kind of in-house tool to do that? Or are you leveraging something? Uh, for assessments, yes. We will actually leverage a, a few different tools. Uh, depending on what the size of the environment is, ultimately will dictate what we're doing. Um, if we're just focusing on one particular section, so take file, for instance, you know, we'll use a specific tool for the file side. Uh, but if it's file and block, you know, we're also going to want to collect additional information about the storage switches, um, about the performance of the switches themselves, you know, what's going on in the environment. Uh, do they need to kind of, maybe it's a software code upgrade that they haven't done. Maybe the, you know, there's some bottlenecks going on at that level, but you will never see it if you just look at one section. So ultimately, when we step in to do an assessment, um, Realistically, we like to try and get as much information as we can about what's going on first, and then we'll make an educated decision on what tool to use. Because today there's so many tools out there, same thing for data migrations. You could name dozens of different tools that you could use for a data migration, but a lot of things factor into what is the right tool for that client and for that migration. You know, is it Data Dynamics, Data Adobe, is it Cirrus, is it Zerto? You know, there's, there's so many different tools out there today. You know, maybe you go back to EMC Open Migrator. Uh, it may not be supported by EMC anymore, but actually does work pretty well if you're ever really in a pinch and the client won't let you do anything else. Um, it does work pretty well. I'm that thought. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so as far as the, the, the data migration piece goes, other things that we really need to understand about that, you know, not just the server inventory, Server list is great, it's the OS, you know how much storage is on it, but it's about the application. What's running on that server? What are the application interdependencies? Because when you're creating a cutover schedule, you move a SQL server, you wanna move everything else that's talking to that SQL server at that time, or else you're gonna have multiple outages and you ultimately you look like an idiot. So you wanna make sure that you have all that information. You know, do they have load balancers, do they have DFS? They have traditional Windows file servers and they're actually consolidating all of those Windows file servers and they're moving it to Isilon or Flashblade or um, you know, uh, NetApp filers. So many different, different things kind of come up as a result of that data migration process and, and going through and understanding all of that information is so important. You know, storage protocols, are they using fiber, iSCSI, FCOE? You know, what do the storage switches look like? Yeah, I mean, look, I mean my, my firm does services very similar to this and these projects are huge and obviously even for small customers they're uh, they're scary for those guys because they don't really realize all the dependencies we're doing one right now that's mm -hmm. from them moving them to a colo from just on-prem and even just that is as a harrowing experience for them because they didn't realize and that you know how are you going to do this they want to have no disruption you're going to have more disruption you really have to get I think up front ask what the expectations are going to be set and make sure that you're keeping them with the customers, you're keeping them with, uh, within a, a set of expectations. Like, look, how, how much do you plan on spending on this? Give me, give me a ballpark mm -hmm. about what your expectations, how many zeros you want to put on this project? Seven. <laughs> or six or that five. Happens. People have different, you know, I mean, you can do lift and shifts, <laughs> or, you know, full lift and shifts in the, in the sixes, small sixes, and depending on, on what you've got and what you're doing. Mm -hmm. But if you're looking for any kind of non disruptive stuff, then it gets, and, and the more non disruptive you get, the more questions you need, really need to ask. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, these projects can be uh, very successful. And if they're successful, you look like a genius. Um, and uh, if you're, Run into a lot of problems, then you say you didn't get enough information. No, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's very true. Do, do you guys have tools for application discovery for doing that mapping? Because I know lots of clients that boy, it's a surprise. Uh, absolutely, looking. and that's what we find. Um, it was funny because one of the biggest things that I did at my last two companies was the business impact analysis, where I sat down with all the business units, did a full discovery of every single application, understood who the point of contacts are. Hey. 
when I schedule a change control, who are we informing that we're gonna take this service down on Saturday at 2 a.m.? Are they okay with that? But we start talking to companies and there's a lot of companies out there that, that they, I'm talking to the storage engineer, it's siloed, they have no idea. They don't know who to go to. They don't know who to talk to. They're just like, hey, I, I don't know, we're just moving it. Saturday at two is fine. Yep. It's not really the case. You know, so sometimes you, it, it's, it's not easy. Um, in order to map out some of those applications, there are some tools out there that you can run uh, to try and do a discover and you scan that, that host and look at all the different IPs that are actually talking to it and then try and correlate that back. Um, the more and more time you spend on discovery, the more and more, you know, obviously, to your point, some of that cost obviously drives up. Some customers are, are not really all that interested. I guess the question I have on, on that, because you guys are coming at this, you know, with, a, with some rigor. Have you developed your own tools? Do you use a standard set of tools for doing the discovery, for doing uh, the planning, for the project planning? Is there a methodology that you've prescribed that you use consistently, or is it on a per customer, we'll figure it out basis? Um, I would say we try and leverage as many automated tools to go in and say, okay, we want to do a, um, on the fiber switches themselves, we want to actually you know, do a gather of the information itself, do a show collect, gather that information. There are some, some canned scripts that we actually have. Uh, and then we find as we start talking with customers, they have a mix of brocade switches and they have Cisco switches or they have some other third party tool where the automated tools themselves aren't as easy to use, so sometimes it does take a little bit of manual effort to go in and actually map that information a little bit more. But I, th I'm, I think I'm referring more to like, okay, do you go in and figure out application dependencies, what's talking to what, um, you know, what order things need to come in and, you know, to, to, to advise up front? Because that's, I mean, I hear you on the fiber channel switches to grab, mm -hmm. obviously grabbing configurations, grabbing topologies, getting visios, it's table, table stakes, but those projects fail and succeed or succeed based on the application dependencies, you move mm -hmm. something that needed to be talked to by something else and all of a sudden you've increased mm -hmm. latency on that and applications break, users commit. Obviously get very upset. You know, yeah. There are times where, in legal this happens a lot, there's a configuration file sitting on the Windows 10 machine that no one knows about that actually is hard coded to the IP address of that file share that, hey, who knew that? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean if you were talking, I'm just saying if you were talking to me out of the blue and I'm a client, you're saying, okay, I want to let me bid on your migration services. I'm going to ask mm -hmm. you specifically, without telling you much about my environment, how are you going to find out about me? Mm -hmm. And you're mm -hmm. going to give me an answer. And if that answer isn't robust and well thought out and prescribed already, that you have a methodology, mm -hmm. I'm yeah, not going I'm to talk further. To you. Um, yep, I, and I agree. Um, as far as some of the automated tools, I know some of the things that we've run into with some of that is even some clients need to go to information security and InfoGov to get approval for any tool that needs to run in their environment to do that scanning and assessment. Uh, and that also is a bit of a challenge. So I think the big thing for us, you know, is starting with our, our typical, you know, discovery questionnaires that we have, sitting down with the customer, asking as much information as we can to try and understand, okay, do they have a good handle of what's going on? Yes or no. Some do, most don't. Most don't. Most don't. So that's <laughs> when even, it starts to get those, a little bit more. Those discovery challenge. questionnaires will, will almost guarantee failure. And, 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 I mean, I've run through so many of these things. If you depend completely on user information, you're going to be whole, whole <laughs> world of hurt. Because they don't, they don't know what dependencies are. They, they don't. They have no idea. Mm -hmm. Especially if you're going with the IT guys who really don't know what the <laughs> applications are doing. It's <laughs> very yeah. true. Um, continuing through, so other stuff, you know, for, let's just talk file migration information real quick. Um, the, there are tools out there so to do, whether you're doing a local migration, you're doing a remote migration, you're moving some portion of that data to the cloud. <clears throat> Maybe you're actually, as part of the data migration for file, you're actually gonna clean up security because at one point in time, everyone thought, you know, everyone full access was a, a good idea uh, to make, you know, file shares easy. Uh, maybe you have connectivity into DFS. And now you need to also understand like how do we actually manage the DFS changes? Who's gonna add in the secondary target? Leave it as a disabled state and on cutover, flip that to enabled. Uh, all that information is really, really important. Um, some of the tools that we actually leverage for, for that side of it, uh, as I mentioned, Data Adobe, Data Dynamics, uh, two really robust tools there to help also with the file discovery process. <clears throat> the, um, you know, the other big things that you ask on the file side is understanding, you know, do they want to move everything? Do they want everything moved as an entirety? Or do they want to say, hey, you know what? Everyone's music collection, we're not going to move that to the net new storage array. We're actually going to consolidate and 
uh, unfortunately, get rid of everyone's music. Oh. <laughs> Filter on. But well, what if they work for Sirius XM? Well, then they're allowed. But there's a lot of times where you know you do have uh, uh, you know the Carpenter's greatest hits uh, over and over and over again, which Close we only need you. one copy. Not so sure about that. <clears throat> um, as far as that discovery process itself, does anybody else have anything else that they want to? add or think we kind of might need for that process. So where are you, where are you putting all the data you collect? Um, we pull all that data in and we actually kind of can, you know, hold on to that for our clients. Yeah, but um, where do you, where, do you yeah. put it into it's, a database, into a spreadsheet? Do it's you? mostly stored in our um, secure shares that we actually have for our, do we have like our internal document management system specific to clients. Right. So we're able to actually maintain that information, track it, and as the, again, touching on the life cycle of a project, you know, we still kind of have that information as we collected it for that client. Track access to that information? Um, absolutely, yes. And, how, and how, do you, how do you determine whether there are any issues with the configuration of the environment before you start? So I'll give you a really simple example. Mm -hmm. Multipathing not working properly. And you decide to move a fabric. You take the fabric down that's working, the other one isn't. Mm -hmm. So the failover doesn't work. Server goes down, etc. That sort of thing. How do you get all of that stuff identified early? So um, when it comes to multipathing, one of the other things that we've actually found, uh, a lot of customers are currently using PowerPath uh, within a lot of their hosts today. Uh, and as part of that migration, they want to eliminate PowerPath from the process. Uh, and they want to take that out and go to native MPIO. So one of the things that we actually have to do as part of that process is testing that failover process and making sure that you know, is it working, yes or no? Do you see traffic on both? Is he only seeing traffic on one? Do you have a dead path? Uh, going in and understanding what's going on there first, yes. Um, on the fabric side, um, you know, we do use Cirrus uh, for our block-based data migrations on, on over fiber. Uh, and that's one of the tools that we'll use. Um, and it does actually help with identifying some of those dead paths. So as you insert Cirrus into that, into that path, um, it will actually see if there's anything that is a dead path or missing or not configured properly. Uh, and then from there, you're able to kind of perform that discovery, uh, begin to mask the current LUNs that are on your source storage array and replicating data to the target storage array. Uh, and then based on the cutover windows, you'll actually do a delta sync and cut over. Practical side, when you're dealing with obviously large amounts of data, a lot of places just don't have the network to move that stuff into the data center. So if you've got standardized processes for mm -hmm. having a staging system that will dump interim data to move it into the data center and then reestablish the links? Um, so some of our other partners that we're actually working alongside, there are some other cloud storage vendors that have actually come to us with that exact challenge where they have a lot of file data. They need help with you know, <coughs> the temporary appliances that we can actually ship to a customer, work with the customer, move the data to that temporarily, Take that now, you know, secured uh, device that's encrypted, yeah. shipping it back to us, and then we'll actually uh, re-ingest that data uh, for that particular client. And in those cases, do you, do you see, this is just curiosity, do you usually see more people saying, no, I want the net new system to be preloaded at my place, start the migration and inject it, or do you see more use of basically a transport mechanism? So far, what we've seen, the transport mechanism has been pretty successful. However, we also you know, have had customers want to precede all that data um, within that existing data center and then physically forklift and move it. Yeah. Um, the nice thing about our company is that's something that we do specialize in. So we have shipping services. We have a, a you know, company that we'll work with in order to help package that up. We'll send engineers on site, bring it, down bring it all online, set the IPs accordingly, get everything ready in that current data center, move all your data over to it, shut it all down, move it, bring it online to the new site, change all the IPs, make sure it's so now working and available. When you do the, when you do the preceding, do you have any kind of, uh, let's say, encryption of the data when it's being transferred to your data center? Are you set something you're looking at or your customers are requesting? So the, as far as whenever we're doing any type of physical shipment, um, one, it has to be a locked container. Um, the key would probably be held by the customer itself. So the, once they actually shut and lock that door, uh, customer now has the key. Customer is now transporting that key off to that particular facility, um, going to the net new data center. So that way it's, you know, ensure that it is 
you know, secured in that shipment. Uh, I'm just thinking about the potential risk if you have some, let's say, quite sensitive customer mm -hmm. who needs to ship some data if that's not something which can be intercepted because, I mean, probably don't see that for large shipments like racks and all, but how many times that has been lost or stolen, so. It's very true, um, you know, and it's, it's um, an absolute challenge. Um, it's one of the ones that, you know, Luckily for us so far, we haven't had too many customers that we have not lost any data at all. We haven't lost any of the hardware that we've shipped. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, we haven't had too many customers push back on that particular request. Yeah, I don't know if, if it's process, something, you know, that of course it has some cost in implementing that and maybe developing that offering. But maybe uh, I think that's something which can certainly give some confidence to the customers to know that you're in charge, their, their data is safe from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, being locked in a container is nice, but I don't know. I think it can really go bad, right? Mm -hmm. One of the questions I have is around, because you're using third party tools to be able to do the migrations, mm -hmm. they all come with licenses. Do you provide them licenses? Are they on volume based license from yourself rather than we do. The customer having to buy them? And are they on the charge for the project or do you pay for them? So. Uh, it's a little bit further in the slide here, but what we've actually come up with, because we do have to go out and actually um, purchase those licenses, they're capacity-based, whether it's Cirrus, Data Adobe, Data Dynamics, Peer, it's a monthly service charge. Um, we are able to, we, what we've come up with for a lot of our partners are these SKUs. So we've given you, you know, X number of terabytes, up to X number of hosts, X, to up, X, X number of cutovers, um, and that comes, you know, with a number and that number will include the licensing, includes the appliances, anything that we actually have to do for shipping. If there's any on-site uh, requirements for our engineers to be there with you to do the actual physical install, all of that is baked into all of these costs. And we've been really successful with some of our other um, OEMs that we're working with with all of these SKUs. We're actually assisting them with the data migrations and they absolutely love being able to kind of just go in from a sales perspective when they sell a storage array they go in, they pick a SKU, a data migration SKU that fits the needs of that particular customer, and there's a number all ready to go. So professional services all baked into all of this information, and it's you know some of our OEMs that we work with hand in hand already have these SKU numbers and costs baked into Salesforce for their their company. <clears throat> uh, and uh, so that's that one there. <clears throat> Any other uh, questions? I'm, I'm, I guess I'm curious that you're talking about the sort of migrations that I probably would have worked on maybe 10 or 15 years ago. <laughs> and, it still I just, and I don't mean that in a negative sense, but just it just seems that's what you're doing. Is that a reflection of the type <coughs> of customers you're dealing with? Or is it because, you know, everybody says we're 70, 80 percent virtualized. So you know, mm -hmm. 70 or 80 percent of the work you're doing should be Storage Pretty vMotion would be easy. Yeah. You now, surprisingly, uh, the biggest thing that I did over the last, you know, 10 years in legal was moving everything to 95 to 98% virtualized. Mm. Uh, you know, we had like two physical servers in both different companies that I had. Uh, any new project that came on board, we had a policy, virtual first. Actually, SaaS first, virtual second. And if we really have to go down the road of physical, we fight it every step of the way because we just didn't want physical servers in our data centers. Surprisingly, a lot of the customers that we're talking to, you know, they do have virtual servers, absolutely. Maybe they're 80, 60, 70% virtualized. But now they're virtual servers themselves. They're not just VMDKs or VHDs, but they're RDMs. And RDMs are not an easy process. They can't just pick up and move. There's a big outage as part of that process. Um, and then on the physical side, surprisingly, there's a lot of people out there with physical servers still kicking around. Uh, whether it's boot from SAN, uh, or the actual data itself is still sitting on physical servers, there's a lot of physical servers still out there. Yeah, so, so a couple of things. First of all, so this is, this is a product that you guys, I guess, so a couple of things. You have the, the, sky, the sky Marketplace is mm -hmm. a very exciting proposition, and that's a product you're creating, uh -huh. right? And that, that's a product and a service that you guys have invented, and you're going to go to the market with partners only. Mm -hmm. it sounds like the other stuff you're doing is like stuff that you're selling direct to customers, correct? Um, no, actually, a lot of our work that we do is direct with partners. All right, so partners are selling this for you? Correct. Or are you doing any direct? Uh, very few. So most of our work that we're doing on the professional service for data migrations is direct with all of our partners. Okay. So, but like you have a pure, you have a pure relationship. 
the Cirrus data stuff, I mean, is, and the, how old is this product? Because I remember the QTAs used to be also a disk box. There, there are more of these out there. Um, but my, my, I guess my, it's a, when we were talking at um, Convolco, mm -hmm. so you guys, I mean, that, that one solution you had, it's ambitious. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it sounds like that, that's the kind of the future of, of yes. things. The, all this other stuff that you're, that you're doing, it's dilutive. A little bit. I mean, it's your. There's a lot you do. You're a big integration company. It sounds like, mm -hmm. and that's great. And you know, everyone's got to make money doing something. Um, and and it sounds like that's going to fund this other product. Is the, is the strategy of your company, I guess, to kind of use that engine to build up this other business, and then that's kind of that that's your that that's your your, your disruptive. You think, know. Yes. So if you're looking at uh, the future of where we really want to go, is more the managed services side. Um, the marketplace, I think, is a big part of that. <laughs> Um, the professional services side of the business, we think that it's still, um, you know, it's still vital to the success of our company um, because at the end of the day, even when we're implementing some of these managed services solutions, you know, have, you still need the engineers on the back end in order to help facilitate that migration or implementation or assisting with the assessment. Uh, so the professional services team and the managed services team themselves work hand in hand together to kind of have, you know, Realistically, what we feel is a uh, unique, uh, and it differentiates us from other just managed services or just professional services companies. Do you have a dedicated team for the marketplace? Yes, we do. That, that does not get shared by your legacy businesses. Correct. Yep, and that was uh, Joe, who was actually at the one of the lead engineers for that marketplace. Uh, Joe is dedicated to that particular project and that managed services. Because in the part in the partner marketplace, all right. Mm -hmm. So. The, the market that that what you're talking about that product is something that I can see partners really getting on board with. Mm -hmm. All this other stuff you're doing, partners do themselves. For the either they've already got partners, mm -hmm. or they've already do themselves. Like for instance, the migration stuff, the company does it for our own customers directly. You know, we've got to provide. If, unless you're just a plain reseller with no people, right? Then there are a lot of those guys, and that's mm -hmm. where you're going to make your money. But um, most of the what? partners that that I work on, you've, right? you've fallen into the you're so good you assume people. Other people are as competent no, as plenty, you are whole. Oh, there's plenty. There's plenty of what they call R's instead of VARs, right? I mean, yeah, there's plenty and, of those. Right, and so there's there there are plenty of people who, not being able to add value themselves, would be glad to resell this. Oh, absolutely, and and, and I think there's there's definitely a market. You already have a market there, mm -hmm. um, but there's the broader market for guys even who do have their own service. The marketplace is different. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's a major differentiator. Um, I know the idea excited me. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I gave you my card, right? Even yeah. though I have to do all the stuff. Um, as long as I felt comfortable that you weren't somehow in conflict, right, and, and there was not going to be a, a, a temptation to go after customers of mine doing other things that I'm not selling of yours, right, that's, that's, that becomes the tricky because I've had other partners that I have partnered that, that I've done this kind of stuff with do that. Yeah, I think the overall, so Brian Davidson and Sean Brady, when they first founded Rockland IT and MSDI, their whole focus was being, you know, they wanted to just work with the partners. They were never going to sell direct. You know, they're not out there looking to say, hey, you know, we would just happen to be working at client XYZ for this vendor and wow, their environment's a mess. There's so much other stuff that we can do, but you know, we leave that stuff alone. You know, as much as it's tempting, you know, we've been really successful being, you know, partner driven and that's really where we want to stay. <coughs> um, the marketplace, I think that also is something that we <coughs> being rebranded by other partners. It's not just something that we're going to sell. We'll sell direct. We'll have our services in there. But we also see ways for companies to take that, rebrand it, put their tiles out there, and we assist them with that process. Yeah. And then they're off and running, focusing on deploying those services as well through a same similar portal. Yeah, the, the model, so a long time ago, there was a storage company called Whiptail that started with a bunch of guys who had an integration and admin staffing company. Yes. Uh, and so or, and they, they kept them, you know, I mean, Let's not just let's not focus on what happened to that company, but mm -hmm. you know how how it got started and how it got, they was definitely they, they kept them completely two separate companies, and I think it benefited them um, because I mean from a business perspective, I don't want to get into that with this, but you know there's valuations and stuff like that. People evaluate different things different ways. Mm -hmm. So like a services company is one thing. A, a mat, you know your 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 marketplace is going to have a separate type of a you know dot com valuation. So it's from a business perspective. I, I mean I, I'm excited about that endeavor. I think that you guys have something interesting and you know that that i don't see anywhere else mm -hmm. I, don't think, I don't know of any other companies doing it that way um so i'm i'm really um looking forward to seeing where you guys take that and uh, just hope it doesn't get 
you know, pulled back, diluted, or in any way by your the stuff, those other stuff that yeah. you do that's successful. It's just a different model. It is, and I know you know our COO Mark Sherman uh, and our CTO John Downey. You know, he came, John came on board about two months ago. Uh, he started Next Gen Storage, and that's really where he started with this idea of the marketplace. Um, and Mark Sherman. You know, has kind of been thinking of a way for us to man, you know, push our managed services offerings, giving it sort of the, you know, easy button. Uh, he really likes to refer to us as sort of the the plumbers of uh, data management. So, you know, we're the ones that are actually putting it all together at the back end. We're helping customers manage that infrastructure all the way through, uh, where re regardless of where they're actually moving it to. Uh, and it's that they're very focused on that direction and taking the the cost the company in you know forward with that direction. The professional services side absolutely helps. Um, you know, my team helps to fund all that stuff, and we, we continue to kind of you know invest in the professional services division you know group. Um, but I think you'll see a lot more traction and more focus on on the managed services side going forward. Could one exist? Could could the market if? Could the marketplace stand alone is the question. Mm -hmm. from a, as a business with just VC investment, I mean, does it need the people from the other side of the business? I don't think not? it does. No, I don't believe it does. I believe our managed services offerings that we have between, you know, e-discovery, um, our file archive, back of the service, DR as a service, all the things that we're doing in our data center from a managed services perspective, you know, those will all help fund that managed services portal and now putting that marketplace all together. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we just like having the professional services side in conjunction with it. Um, no, I kind of touched on some of these, and for some reason the slide is in, not doesn't have everything in it. Uh, but again, sort of the the file um, migration. So kind of talking about the discovery, scoping, migration, monitoring, and reporting, and then kind of finalizing that process. So whenever you're moving that data around on the file side, um, it's great to kind of have an assessment of okay, you had one billion files. You know, we moved a billion files. We didn't move, you know, one point two or less, 900,000 would be bad. <laughs> um, and with that, I know I kind of skipped ahead previously and talked a little bit about our, our migration <clears throat> packaging that we've kind of put together. Um, you know, this, is, uh, this has been really helpful for us um, with having these SKUs, making it easy for salesmen to kind of go out and sell um, and put these numbers together and really not have to think about a data migration. Uh, is that's, I think, one of the bigger challenges is they don't really know what to ask and it always ends up being asked way too late. So if we get involved earlier in the sales cycle where they're picking these, <coughs> hey, do you, you know, you're buying that E8 storage or you're buying your Dell EMC Unity storage, whatever it may be, do you need help with the data migration portion? You know, all right, I just sold 150 terabytes, here's 150 terabyte SKU, and here you go, you're off and running. How do you compete against vendors who um, basically just throw that in as professional services into the deal? It's, it's definitely, you know, it's, it's never really easy because there are a lot of customers that will, you know, it's not really thrown in. It's no, just baked into the margin of yeah. the hardware. And effectively, uh, they'll force the vendor to say, mm -hmm. you're, you're doing that as part of the, the getting the deal from us, mm -hmm. know, depending on how big it is, of course. Absolutely. Um, it does become a challenge. I think some of the things that what we've also done um, that helps to actually swing things back in our direction is when we go out and we talk to the customers about, you know what, what are you doing with the old hardware? Who's taking the four racks of the DMX4 that's sitting there today that you're migrating off of? Who's taking all those? The old vendor. Do you need help with that? New vendor. Again, the, same thing. Not always. Some really? vendors don't. You know, yeah, we've I've actually been found in a couple of deals where both EMC and NetApp forgot. Well, they paid the trade-in, and then never actually picked up. They don't. The gear pick up. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, that, 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 that's old. That, hap that happens all the time. <laughs> they they will happily cut you a check to discount. All right, we'll take that off the floor. They never take it off the floor. Nope. <laughs> so that's where we come in and we're able to kind of help offset some of those costs. How do you think I populated my lab? <laughs> <laughs> reduce, reduce costs. And then that, I think, also allows us to, to win the business.